Hi, I'm Joe Pompeo. I'm the media correspondent at Vanity Fair. Um, I'm going to assume that probably everyone in this room knows who Jeff Zucker is, but just in case, um, uh, he spent 25 years at NBC, including running the Today Show at the age of 26, uh, and eventually becoming the CEO of NBC Universal. Uh, six years ago, he came to CNN as the president of CNN Worldwide, and as I reported last year, he's signed on to be there at least through the 2020 election. Oh, you reported that? That was you? I think, I think it was me. Okay. That's, um, <clears throat> President Trump has uh, called for Jeff Zucker's firing, uh, but apparently his bosses at AT&T were not listening because just last week, instead of firing Jeff, they gave him a promotion. Uh, on Monday, he was named. <laughs> on Monday, he was named chairman of Warner Media News and Sports, which now also gives him oversight of Turner Sports, Bleacher Report, and AT&T's regional sports network, and he reports directly to the CEO of uh, Warner Media. John Stanky. I think that's a great place to start. So Jeff, thank you for, for being here. Thank you, Joe. Happy to be here. Uh, you know, last time we spoke at length, I think it was back in the fall, I was doing a, a, a piece for Vanity Fair about CNN. It feels like uh, a lot has happened since then in just a few months, the most recent being this new role that you have uh, at, at Warner Media. And talking to you know, some people at CNN, I know there's at least some you know, concern about, you know, is this going to take uh, you, you know, this new role overseeing sports this is going to take time away from, from what, you know, Jeff's time overseeing news as well. And, you know, granted, I know that you did run all of NBC Universal, um, uh, so I'm sure you can handle it. But nonetheless, you know, will you be able to devote as much time to CNN as you have, especially, you know, heading into an election season? Yeah. So uh, I'm incredibly excited about this new role. Uh, obviously, my two passions in life are, are news and sports. And so uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to work in both worlds. But obviously, uh, CNN uh, remains, uh, you know, fundamentally the, the, the most important uh, thing. Uh, I think that, you know, making sure that CNN continues to be strong and, and making sure that CNN continues to, to play the important role that it does, you know, in, in society uh, is paramount to me. So obviously, uh, I will devote uh, a, a good amount of time to, to sports, but I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, leave CNN or devote uh, uh, any less time. Uh, I think I have the capacity to to be able to handle both. So your, your journalists can all can they take a breath and they. they well, I don't. Play. I don't know that. So, you know, some of them may look. Uh, some of them wish I probably did spend more time uh, <laughs> on sports, but um, you know, uh, uh, I'm excited to be able to play in both worlds, and and I'm not leaving CNN, and I'm not gonna uh, be much less involved at all. The other big news that has, has recently uh, developed is that um, uh, the Department of Justice lost its appeal um, to uh, try uh, to overturn a decision a federal court made to allow AT&T to acquire Time Warner, um, right. which is now known as, 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 Warner, as Warner Media. And last year when, uh, you know, when they were first going to court uh, to try to block this deal, um, you know, there was, you know, there was concern about uh, um, you know, was this driven by political motivations, and specifically because, um, you know, the president obviously has a vendetta against uh, you and your, and, your, and your network. And there was a perception that, you know, that was driving it, even though they said this is all about antitrust. Um, so now, you know, we have this new reporting in The New Yorker from Jane Mayer, uh, where I think it's worth reading this. Uh, she says, she writes, in the late summer of 2017, a few months before the Justice Department filed suit, Trump ordered Gary Cohn to pressure the Justice Department to intervene. According to a well-informed source, Trump called Cohn into the Oval Office, along with John Kelly, who had just become the Chief of Staff, and said in exasperation to Kelly, I've been telling Cohn to get this lawsuit filed and nothing's happened. I've mentioned it 50 times and nothing's happened. I want to make sure it's filed. I want that deal blocked. Uh, Cohn didn't, didn't take the bait, but I just wanted to know, at this, at this point, what do you believe in this matter? It's, it's becoming a big deal now. The Democrats are, are looking into this. Uh, what do you believe? Was, it, was this politically motivated? I think at this point it's somewhat moot because uh, we've, uh, you know, the, it, the deal has gone through and they've said that they're no longer going to uh, appeal to the Supreme Court, which would have been the next uh, appeal. Do I think that uh, there was political motivation behind trying to block the deal? I do. Uh, and I believe it came from the highest levels uh, of the government. Highest, so you believe it came from the president? I do. <clears throat> um, you know, staying on, on AT&T. Uh, <laughs> I can expand upon that, but... Exp go, the, please, the, by all means, expand. I the don't answer want, I don't is, know. I do. I mean, you know, I mean, 
Look, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, uh, there was absolutely no basis for the government to, to be doing what they were doing, and, and so clearly there was a, a political agenda at work, and uh, I don't think it takes uh, a genius to figure out where that came from. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that settles that. Um, <laughs> You know, and also when AT&T was in the process of, of acquiring Time Warner, again, which is now, which is now called Warner Media, just to keep everyone straight. Um, you know, there's also concern about how much autonomy the company's top executives would retain under the new leadership, whether you would all gel with management. Um, there's also concerns about CNN's editorial independence and whether, whether your, your new bosses at AT&T uh, would be as uh, you know, hands-off as... as uh, well, can I address that? Yes. Yeah. Like Look, I, I will say, you know, I've had the uh, good fortune. Uh, uh, I, I had great bosses uh, when I was at NBC Universal, at GE, at the GE corporate level, Jack Welch and Jeff Immelt. Uh, Jeff Bukas was a terrific boss uh, at Time Warner uh, overseeing CNN. I, I will say that, that AT&T has been um, fantastic in, in terms of... Uh, uh, editorial independence for CNN, I, I, I think it's as, as good as any experience that I've ever had, and I've had a lot of, a lot of experience like this. Um, they've been incredibly true to their word. Uh, there has been zero uh, interference, and uh, I think CNN enjoys complete editorial independence. Yeah, and beyond editorial independence, um, you know, just in terms of working with this new, this new team, uh, John Stanky, who you report to, also Randall Stevenson, other executives there. Um, you know, we just saw this week your colleagues Richard Plepler and, and David Levy have left. Yet, yeah, you know, you're sticking around. You're expanding your role. You know, should we take this overall as a sign that this marriage is working? At least for at least for CNN, there haven't been any major disagreements so far. Look, I think there are individual reasons for for you know uh, why people um, decided to move on, and so um, those are those are unique to, to them. With regard to my situation, uh, I've, uh, I've got a very good relationship with, uh, with John and, uh, and very comfortable. And I'm, as I said, I'm very excited to, to be uh, given the opportunity to lead this expanded group. So I, I, I have nothing but, uh, uh, but confidence in the relationship. How, cl how closely do you, I mean, how often are you um, in touch with, with, with John or these, these guys? I mean, do you have a good working relationship? Is it, are you, are you relative, are they relatively, Hands off on a day-to-day -day basis. They are. Yeah, they are. Um, so a few weeks ago, there was there was a pretty big uproar uh, over uh, a controversial hire at at CNN. Um, uh, you got a lot of criticism for the hiring of Sarah Isker Flores in a senior editorial role uh, that would involve coordinating political coverage as well as being an, an on-air um, analyst. And you know the reason there was so much consternation over this, I think, is because she was. Uh, you know, most recently a spokeswoman for the, for the Justice Department. She's a longtime um, re uh, Republican political operative. She had zero journalism um, experience. Now, yesterday she, she tweeted and said, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I thought about it. I'm just going just gonna to be an analyst uh, for now, at least to start. Um, so she, you know, came around. Was this, was this her decision, pure, purely her decision? Or, uh, you know, you know what, what, what accounted for the change, yeah. I guess? Yeah. So, uh I think that uh, over the last couple of weeks, some things uh, changed in her own life. Uh, she got married uh, unexpectedly, and in the uh, last, she unexpectedly in the last few weeks got, got married. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really feel that comfortable talking All about right. her personal <laughs> life. But uh, she, she, uh, she decided to get married, and so, uh, uh, so I think you know a couple of things changed with regard to, <laughs> to where she is in in in, in her life and. With that, I think she uh, decided that it made more sense at this time to just, just go forward with the on-air political commentating role. Um, we were certainly comfortable with that, and, uh, and so that's, uh, that's what we'll do. And you know, just because there was such, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, concern and criticism about this, I want to ask you, you know, to kind of tell us why, you know, you thought she was a good hire. And, you know, the most, I think the most scathing uh, criticism I read was in Margaret Sullivan's Washington Post column. She quoted uh, Bill Gruskin from the Columbia Journalism School saying uh, that Isker's lack of journalistic experience caused him to wonder, quote, if Jeff Zucker, if Jeff Zucker would ever have brain surgery performed by a dentist. Um, so first, were these criticisms fair? And second, since, since we're here now, um, you know, I, I heard that you were pretty involved in bringing her on to CNN. So just tell us, you know, why did you think her, she was a good hire in you know, not just you know, yeah. traditional analyst role, why was she someone that you thought sure. would, would be someone to, to have an editorial role? Yeah. Like the, well, for the record, I would not have brain surgery by a dentist. That's one. 
to, uh, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a little unusual to talk about the reasons you hire or don't hire individual people, but I do understand the uh, interest and attention in, in Sarah because of her previous role. So I will, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk about it. Look, uh, I, I think that, first of all, uh, this is not brain surgery. And so that analogy, I think, is, is silly. Uh, number two, uh, there is a long line and a long history of people who have moved from politics into, uh, into television and into journalism and vice versa. So the idea that people can't do that, I think, is also silly. Uh, third, uh, she was uh, hired to come in in a role that uh, was going to help uh, our, our political team moving around uh, uh, correspondents and producers and, 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 and the like. And so her prior political experience would be helpful in, in knowing you know, where stories uh, might be developing and might be going, but she wasn't in any way going to be determining our political coverage or having editorial oversight over that political coverage, which I think was the misunderstanding of columnists and journalism professors and, and things like that. So uh, I, I didn't really see any uh, uh, issue with, with having someone who was smart and uh, understood uh, the way that Washington and, and the world works as part of our organization. And frankly, uh, uh, I thought that, you know, unfortunately a lot of people just made assumptions based on their own biases and didn't uh, really take the chance to to uh, understand what it was about. So that's okay. But at this point, it, 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 none of that matters anyway. Moot point now, but is the, right. door, is the door open for her in the future to, to move into a role like that? Listen, we, we, we would you know, have that conversation at, at a time that anyone thought it was appropriate. Let's talk about uh, 2020 coverage. One thing I've heard that you want to make uh, CNN's 2020 coverage more about is, is policy. Um, someone told me you've started telling anchors and reporters, don't be afraid of policy. I'm just curious, how, you know, how do you make that work on cable news in a news cycle like this, you know, where audiences are, are craving segments about Russia and Mueller, uh, whatever the late house, latest White House controversy is, and also these sort of partisan grudge matches that yeah. we see play out. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, first of all, uh, you know. Is that right? Is that right about the focus on policy? Yeah, a, a couple of things. I think it's, you know, CNN gets lumped in as a cable news network, because it is a cable news network, but there's a connotation that comes along with being a cable news network. And I think that's uh, sometimes uh, we get brandished with a, with a, a wide brush uh, of what the other uh, networks are like. You know, I think what we're, what we're interested in is less uh, of the uh, partisan food fight, which exists. I mean, uh, so I'm not trying to pretend that there won't be uh, uh, some of that, because that's just natural, uh, the natural world we live in. But I, I do want to make sure, especially with so many Democrats running on the Democratic side, with, with so many people rightly saying that there wasn't enough policy conversation in 2016, that we are not afraid of that policy conversation, not afraid of, of uh, you know, doing uh, serious, uh, both journalism and seri serious conversations about policy. I think we've made that clear in, in a lot of our coverage thus far. I think we've made it clear through the early town halls that we've been doing, uh, three of which we're gonna do again here tomorrow night. Uh, that, you know, obviously the, the tweet of the day and, the, and the, the silly nicknames that get thrown out there and brandished are, are obviously going to get some attention. But what my point is that I don't want that to dominate the coverage and I don't want that to be what it's all about. Are there certain areas of policy you think will be particularly important? No, I mean, I, I don't think that there's, I, I mean, I think obviously there, there's, uh, you know, a whole buffet of, of issues that, uh, that are going to be critical to uh, the next election, and I, I don't think we should limit them, and we should go where, where the conversation goes. Uh, you've called Fox News, one of your cable news competitors, state-run TV um, and, and pure propaganda. Where do you come down on this issue of, uh, you know, their exclusion from the DNC uh, debates, being excluded from being able to yeah. host debates? So I have a, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, you know, look, I, I don't think that anyone is, has the right to, to be, uh, to, or, or to have the sense that they have the right, or uh, there's an obligation on the part of one of these political parties to give an outlet a debate. So 
I think that the outrage is, uh, or the, the, the consternation about this is frankly a little misplaced. There, there's, the, you know, they don't have to give one to CNN. They don't have to give one to NBC. Uh, there's no obligation to give one to Fox. Uh, so so I, I think that that, that is, is uh, misplaced, and I don't think that it's certainly within the DNC's right to make that decision. There's been this, this point made that, well, they're missing out on, on talking to a different audience. Well, the fact is, every one of those candidates who's running should go on Fox News and do interviews, right? Uh, and, and they'll reach that audience that way. But the, this idea that, that they're owed a debate because they'll reach a different audience, I think, is silly. And now, at the same time, uh, you know, I, so, so I, I don't know why we, we would be asked to say, oh, we think Fox should get a debate. Um, the fact is, as I said in my prior comments, I think Fox News has done a tremendous amount of damage to this country uh, in, in, in the way that they, uh, uh, you know, in the way that channel is. And I think that they've done a lot of, a lot of damage to the political discourse in this country. So I think the idea that the DNC would be under any obligation to give them a debate is wrong. At the same time, if, if the DNC sought to bar one of the reporters that do work at, at Fox from covering the debate, I think that would be uh, something that we would stand up and say, no, you, you can't bar uh, a reporter from covering uh, the debate or being in the press room at the debate. That would be wrong. Um, just as we have stood up and publicly said that it's wrong and inappropriate for people to go to Tucker Carlson's house uh, and, you know, protest and try to uh, intimidate his family. That's wrong, and we stand up and say that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that there's any obligation on our part or others to say that uh, they're entitled to a debate, because I don't think they are. I don't think anybody's entitled to a debate, and I do think that there is some... Uh, some credence to the idea that, you know, Fox has done a lot of damage to the political discourse in this country. Well, and part, and part of the, you know, for anyone who's not following this closely, this again uh, I th seems to be a decision that was driven by this, this Jane Mayer piece in The New Yorker, which really went into the, the unusually uh, or unprecedentedly close relationship between the admini this administration and Well, and I, Fox I, I've News. said, you quoted it, I've said for a long time, Fox is state-run TV. It's a question, really, I think the question is, is, uh, is Fox state-run TV or is, uh, or is the White House, uh, you know, uh, um, state-run government by Fox TV? I mean, it's just, it's, uh, the relationship between the two is completely symbiotic, and I think uh, it is a propaganda outlet for Fox News. When we say that or say things like that, then the two or three, you know, folks who are very, very good, excellent, uh, reporters at Fox, you know, everybody gets in an uproar and says, oh, but there's these two or three really good people. Well, you know, the fact is they've chosen to work at Fox and, uh, and uh, you know, they don't get to hide behind the fact that they're excellent uh, journalists or, or, or anchors. Um, the fact is they work at a place that has done a tremendous amount of damage to this country. CNN has a much different relationship with, with the White House, I think it's Well, it'd be called non-existent, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, so Mike, you know, um, I mean, how, uh, what is the relationship between specifically your network and, and the press shop and uh, right. well, Sarah Sanders? Right, well, I mean, look, I, I'm joking and I'm being flippant. The fact is we have, we have, a, uh, we have a good relationship um, with the White House. I mean, uh, uh, John Bolton uh, was on State of the Union last week. Mom, Mike Pompeo was on State of the Union the week, the week before. Uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Kellyanne Conway come on, uh, come on CNN from time to time. Uh, uh, you know, Larry Kudlow comes on CNN. Um, the, uh, so, so there are uh, folks who, who um, come on CNN and, and we want that and we, we, we ask for that all the time. Uh, the fact is neither Donald Trump nor Mike Pence has uh, done an interview with CNN since they've been in office. Have you been try have you been yeah, and, going and for it? Of course. They have a standing invitation. We ask all the time. We're the only major uh, uh, outlet in the United States that they haven't done an interview with. That's certainly their prerogative. We, we are not, you know, they, they don't have an obligation to do an interview with us. See my prior comments about debates. Uh, you know, we're not entitled to an interview. 
uh, but we'd certainly uh, love to have them come on. Uh, I think they have their reasons uh, why, and that's fine. Their others do come on, and so, you know, we enjoy a good relationship in, in that respect. We've all, you know, we've all seen these uh, uh, tense exchanges between Sarah Sanders and, and Jim Acosta, and um, do you ever get the phone call, do you ever get angry phone calls from, from Sarah Sanders? Well, you haven't, seen the, you haven't seen that in about three months, because they haven't done a, a White House press briefing in, in more than three months. But, um, when, yeah, when does it rise to the level where you get, where you get the phone call? They're no, I, um, they don't call me. They call our Washington bureau chief <laughs> to complain, and, and he's excellent at taking those phone calls. Have you heard from Trump directly at any time in the past two years since he's been, he's been president to complain uh, about anything, or, or to not complain, say hello? Um, he's complained, yes. You got, so he's, he's, he's reached out directly, phone or email, and... I, I, I have heard complaints from the president. Tell, tell us more, what, what, what was he upset about? Everything. <laughs> um, you know, since we're, we're at South by Southwest, we uh, want to talk, uh, you know, about CNN and its digital operation as well. I'm sure there's people here who'd like to hear about that. Um, you know, again, more news uh, recently that the uh, Wall Street Journal reported that um, Warner Media is particularly interested in, in CNN digital, specifically increasing investment in data product technology, um, yeah. what is driving that and why has Warner Media chosen this as an area of focus? Yeah, I think what's driving that is that we asked for it. Um, so I think that you, you alluded to that Wall Street Journal article, I think, which was, uh, uh, there, which seemed to try to intimate that uh, Warner Media and AT&T felt there was a need to uh, invest to supercharge CNN's digital operation. Couple, couple of things that I think are important. Uh, I think that uh, Warner Media and AT&T do want to uh, invest and supercharge CNN's digital operation because CNN asked them to do that. Um, CNN is the uh, uh, biggest, uh, most used, uh, most viewed uh, uh, digital news and information operation in the world. And uh, over the last five years has grown tremendously and, uh, and, and has done an excellent job, uh, and we're incredibly uh, proud of, of that operation. And, uh, and uh, what we have done over the last five years is invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, and done a tremendous amount of, of hiring in that, uh, in that organization, and the results uh, speak for themselves. To continue to, uh, to continue to grow, to continue to, uh, uh, take advantage of new technology, uh, new products, uh, to take advantage of AT&T's incredible mobile uh, footprint. Um, we, uh, we went to AT&T and asked them uh, for even further investment. Will that include jur journalists as well? You're hiring more reporters? Yeah, to, to, be, to be frank, th this investment that we've asked for and that they've agreed to and that was, you know, uh, alluded to in that piece, uh, was, uh, was really less about journalists, you know, because we, we've, we've hired a tremendous amount of, uh, of journalists, both for, for television and digital uh, over the last few years, but was more about uh, um, data science and, and audience development and, uh, uh, and uh, technology uh, and infrastructure that we've gotta continue to, to maintain. So it was really more about uh, it was more about data science and and uh, uh, and that kind of thing uh, than anything. And uh, AT and T has been terrific. Uh, Warner Media, really, it's not the AT and T level; it's the Warner Media level, uh, has been uh, terrific and very receptive. And so um, I think the uh, the way that story was cast was was actually inaccurate. And it's CNN that asked for it, and AT and T, Warner Media. Uh, has said yes. What, is your, what are your thoughts on the overall uh, digital media landscape right now? There's kind of this narrative in the air over the past few months that the coin, the coin has sort of flipped where you know, these unicorns um, that looked a few years ago like they were you know, poised to like take over the world and yeah. put everyone else out of business. They seem to be struggling now and then there's some of the major legacy players you know, have returned to a position of strength. Yeah, what so I, I think that's the case. I mean, look, I think everybody uh, chases the shiny new object, and and everybody wants the the new upstart uh, to uh, to take on the the legacies and to knock them off, and 
and there's always excitement around the, the new thing. And, and we understand that, and we've tried to actually you know, play in some of the new things too. Um, I think what, what we've seen uh, over the last few years, and certainly with our success, is that uh, it's not so easy, uh, and it takes the uh, ta right kind of uh, infrastructure and organization and experience to, to succeed. And I think that we've proven that, and that's why we've become such the dominant player in the news and information digital space. And so uh, um, uh, I'm proud of that and, and recognize at the same time that's why we've got to keep moving and got to keep growing because there's always somebody nipping at your heels. What's the metric that makes you the, the, the dominant player in the digital? Is that just based on the traffic, which CNN Digital has? has well, any, any traffic metric of? you want to use. Uh, CNN is is number one. Well, who who do you think digitally you can you compete with then? So I think I think we compete with everybody, I, and I think this is the interesting <laughs> thing about CNN, and I think this is why CNN gets so much uh, attention, and, and and everybody everybody focuses on CNN because I think we play uh, we play, you know we compete uh, against television networks, we compete against broadcast and cable television networks, we complete compete against the great. Uh, Newspapers, the, whether they're the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, uh, or, or or great magazines like Vanity Fair or, or outlets like that, we compete with the with the digital upstarts and the and the new uh, new entrants as well. So everybody is trying to is trying to compete with us, right? You know, in the television space, most of those players are, are competing against themselves, and you know, in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, think they're competing against themselves but they're all also competing against us, so we kind of get it from, from each side. So in the digital space, we're competing against all of them, all of those places, uh, and, uh, and even so, um, we're still the, the dominant number one player. You know, so amongst these, some of these you know, newer digital outlets that have risen up over the past 10 years, I mean, are there some that have really impressed you? Like, are there people that, are there, are there outlets that you look at and you feel you know, uh, they're, they're doing a really good job. I think that they're gonna end up being sustainable in the, in the long run. Oh, you know, listen, there, there's a lot of really good. Uh, I'm giving you an easy one here. Tell me who you like, not who you, who you, who you don't no, but like. I mean, listen, when you, the, listen there, there's a lot of really good um, new digital entrants into the news and information space. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I look at, for instance, a, a place like Axios, uh, which has just come into the, the, the news and information space in the last few years, and I think they've done a really good job. Uh, um, and, and but you know they're, they're, the amount of traffic and users that, that frequent them is not even in the same you know universe uh, as CNN. Uh, they 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 hope to get to profitability uh, this year. You know uh, we're doing incredibly well. So you know I think it's just different spaces. Can you talk a little bit about CNN's relationship with the platforms, and I guess specifically your relationship with Facebook? Because we all know there's kind of a, this famously fraught, sometimes downright hostile relationship um, with a lot of publishers and, yeah. and journalism folks. So, how, how is CNN's relationship with Facebook? Yeah, so it's, it's look, it's complicated, right? Um, uh, and we, uh, we, we have, Facebook has been uh, an important, uh, partner for us through the years, um, but like many, we, we don't want to rely on Facebook for our uh, traffic or for our distribution or overly, overly rely on them, um, and I think that uh, they haven't been uh, the best of partners um, with regard to, to that through the years, so um, it's, uh, it's complicated, and, and we're not going uh, to stake our future on relying on them for our distribution. You're doing a Facebook watch show. We uh, are, and so right like now, I said. With, with we, Anderson we, Cooper. We are, so we do, we do that show, uh, and you know, that, so that's one example of being a partner. How, what do you get from that? How's that, how's that doing? Because the idea is that, especially for smaller news outlets, Facebook will, yeah. can come and, you know, here's however many million, few million so, dollars to go and, go and hire some people and make a show. Yeah, so again, we don't need Facebook <laughs> um, um, in the long run. Um, we've been happy to try this with them for the last, I don't know what it is, eight months now. Uh, I don't know if that's something that will continue or not. Uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't made that final decision. Um, it's been a good experiment, but it's not, it's not critical to, to the, the CNN brand. How many, how many people watch Anderson Cooper on, on Facebook? On, on Facebook I, I don't know, I don't have these, I don't have that metric, I don't know. Um, 
I think also there's probably some people in the room who are, are here for, to see films. Um, and CNN has done a lot of good films and original series, documentary, you know, really you know, high quality stuff. Um, obviously, Anthony Bourdain was a huge success for you guys. Um, you've done a lot of other really good productions, uh, including R RGB, RBG, uh, RB RBG uh, which was nominated for an Oscar. And I, I think I heard that Apollo 11 is screening here tomorrow. And, th and there's been others too. But in, in any case, this has been an area of, uh, uh, you know, of growth yeah. for CNN in, in recent years. Um, is Warner Media committed to investing in uh, expanding in, in that part of the operation? Yeah, and how, I, how important will films and series be going forward? Yeah, look, films, films and series are an important part of our uh, DNA at, at CNN. Uh, Warner Media uh, really hasn't taken a position one way or the other. I mean, they're, they're supportive of, of CNN, and, and if CNN continues to think that's important, then they'll be supportive of that. We continue to think that it's important, so, uh, and the reason we think it's important is that it differentiates us from those other uh, networks that are, that are, you know, put into the cable news category, uh, and that's how we, we, we think we're different. We're doing, we're, you know, we're doing uh, a lot of different things, uh, series and films are part of that. Series and films are also important because, you know, the news cycle has been amazing these last three years, right? It's been the three best years in terms of viewership in the history of CNN. Um, but, but series and films also differentiated us, differentiate us and give us uh, a reason to talk to different viewers who are not interested in the, in the news cycle, different advertisers who wouldn't otherwise want to be part of the news cycle. Uh, so. So I think that it's really been an important part of our brand, and, and that's going to continue. You've done do dozens of these, uh, right? We have, yeah. How many are in development right now? I, you know, I mean, uh, listen, we, ha we have tons of development in place. We run about uh, 10 to 12 original series uh, a year. We run about uh, four to six films a year. Obviously, there's multiples of each of those in development. Um, you know, our slate for 2019 and 2020 is pretty well set. We're currently working on uh, development for 2021, so uh, it's it's just uh, it's just a it's part of the DNA of CNN now. CNN to us is about the journalism that we do, the the news that we break and the breaking news that we cover. It's about the digital strength that we talked about, and it's about these original series and films. That's what CNN is about. We get you know we get a lot of attention for for something we do over here or or you know, hiring somebody uh, who's just one person. But it is much bigger than that. We're also a global network, unlike, you know, th there are really tr only two truly global television networks in the world, uh, BBC and CNN. Uh, and, uh, and so we're a global enterprise. We're a global digital enterprise. It's just, uh, that's, that's the DNA of CNN. One of the other things that's happening at, at, at Warner Media is they're putting together, um, as everyone is, a, a streaming service, um, which you know be kind of HBO centric, but it's also going to pull, it's going to roll up, um, you know, TNT, TBS, its own originals, uh, the, the, the Warner Brothers film library. Some of these films that you're doing is that, uh, you know, will that service be a natural home for these? Will these will these maybe exist on the for our series and films? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that because uh, think... CNN is not explicitly not right a part news of that. and sports, uh, the, the live news and live sports component of of. Uh, of Warner Media now um, is not part of the uh, of the direct consumer offering certainly in this initial thinking um, but I think that our, our series and films will have a very strong home uh, within the direct consumer offering and so that'll be another another outlet for them yeah are there any uh, particular are there any exciting ones you could tell us about that are that are that are coming up in the next year that haven't been announced that are <laughs> Well, look, I mean, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Apollo 11, which I would encourage everyone to see here. I mean, we, we, we've had a, a great run on our films. Uh, RBG was, was nominated for the Oscar. Three Identical Strangers, uh, which was just an incredibly compelling story. Those are two of the most successful documentaries, box office documentaries of all time. I think Apollo 11, which is the, the story this year, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Man's Landing on the Moon. This is the story of that. Everybody knows the ending, so you go, you know, how, that, how can that be uh, compelling? Well, what this has done is unearthed uh, never-before-seen uh, footage of that, uh, that Amer American triumph, and it's just incredibly compelling. 
uh, and I'd encourage everyone to see that. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna do, uh, we've done, we've had great success at CNN covering uh, the, the history of uh, America through the decades. We did the 60s, we did the 70s, we did the 80s, we did uh, the 90s. Uh, this summer we're gonna do the decades of movies and take, take a look at uh, great movies by decades. So, so that's something we're excited about. Um, and, uh, and Van Jones, who has been just such a, a critical part of CNN's uh, success uh, as both, uh, um, as both a, a commentator and the host of his own show, is going to come uh, now with an uh, original series of his own called Redemption, uh, which uh, brings together uh, uh, people who are, are willing to forgive uh, those who have taken their loved ones' lives, and it's just an incredibly compelling uh, new series that, that will premiere this spring. So, you know, those are some of the things that are in works. I have a couple more before we get to sure. questions from the audience. Uh, um, you know, everyone, you've been in TV a long time, and everyone is trying that to... That just means I'm old, but yeah. You're old, and you've been in TV a long time, and, uh, you know, everyone is, is trying to, to get, you know, their, their piece of this, you know, the, the streaming battles are, like, are heating up. Right. Um, and obviously, Warner Media is, is, is going to battle. In, in that as well. I mean, where is, is anyone, are any of these going to be able to, to really unseat Netflix? And how do you feel about, uh, you know, Warner Media's chances with its roll up that it's putting yeah, together? Yeah, well, look, I mean, um, I, I, I think that uh, Warner Media has uh, as good a chance as anybody to succeed in this space because of the tremendous uh, brands and libraries that they bring uh, to the game. And, and so I, I think that you'd have to say that Warner will have as, as, as good a shot as anyone. Do I think that, that someone can compete with Netflix? Of course someone can complete, compete with Netflix. Um, there's no reason to believe they can't. Uh, Netflix has had a tremendous amount of success relying on, uh, in many respects on other people's content, so that's gonna change. Uh, and they've done a lot of great original work, uh, obviously as well, but but there's no reason that these other uh, new entrants uh, can't do that same kind of great work. So, look, I think that, that not everyone will succeed, but I think that Warner Media is as well positioned as anyone to give it a shot. You, uh, you have talked uh, uh, about you know, possibly having political ambitions maybe after your, your TV career is over, and you've, uh, you've floated the idea you might want to run for office someday. How, how real is that, um, and what type of office might that, might that be? So... Look, it, you know, I, I've been asked this question now for 30 years. I think if you go back to the first uh, profile I did with the Wall Street Journal uh, when, when I was, became the executive producer of, of the Today Show uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, I think the last line of that piece said, you know, and he harbors uh, political ambitions. So, uh, you but know, you said, re I mean, you, you said recently. No, I understand. On, on, I understand. I, I, I'm, the, uh, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying podcast. to run away from it. I, 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 I all I'm saying is I've harbored these ambitions for 30 years. Uh, I, I'm still, you know, I'm still interested in the idea. Um, you know, at some point, I'd probably like to really uh, give that a shot. It's not imminent. It's not happening this year. It's not happening next year. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see where the world goes. I'm still interested. Is in that doing more on the level of you know going back to Miami, maybe running running for mayor of your hometown, or are you thinking uh, something? Uh, I'm not running for the mayor of Miami. Um, so, um, so I love talking. Miami. I love Miami. That's going to get completely misconstrued. I love Miami. It's fantastic. Uh, but um, you know, I, I don't know what I would would be interested in. But I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in perhaps one day exploring that public service. Uh, it's not imminent. Uh, and you know, last one for you. You had you had heart surgery um, not long ago. You you seem great. You seem healthy. I mean, you're doing well. Yeah. Uh, everything is. You're feeling good. So uh, I had open heart surgery last summer to uh, fix an issue that I'd had for 10 years, uh, or that you know I'd had my whole life that had really become an issue the last 10 years. Uh, it went incredibly well. Everything was fixed. I feel great and. Uh, and uh, I consider myself incredibly fortunate. So we have a little under 20 minutes for questions from, I guess, the audience. Um, and let's see, I, mean, I feel like wow. you can never get through as many of these as, as uh -oh. the audience wants. Okay. Um, so let's go, the first one, is CNN growing so much on digital, 
uh, and if, if CNN is growing so much on digital and is innovating everywhere, why did they close down Beam and their Snapchat show, among other digital startups of theirs? Well, look, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, uh, and I think the answer is because we're, <coughs> we're continuing to innovate all the time. And, you know, we tried, uh, we tried with Beam to, to partner with Casey Neistat, who, who we continue to think the world of, and reach uh, a very different audience from, from uh, the audience that consumes uh, CNN and even Great Big Story. And, you know, we just couldn't figure that one out. Uh, and, and I think that's okay. I, I think the idea that you try things, and if it doesn't work, you know, that's what innovating is all about. Uh, and so I don't think it means that, oh, there's a problem at CNN Digital. It means, oh, they're trying, they're innovating, and not everything's going to work. If everything worked that we tried and innovated, um, then, uh, then I think, you know, it wouldn't be realistic. I think, the, I think the, 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 the hard balls are coming at you now. Given that President Trump uses White House press briefings to propagate his lies, why should CNN and other press networks continue to cover them live? Yeah, well, listen, it, it's a fair question, and we, 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 we have struggled with this, uh, with this a lot. For, number one, um, it's not an issue because there's no more press uh, conferences, okay? So uh, that, that issue has kind of been taken out of our hands. Number two, to the degree that there are, you know, I, I understand the, the, the sentiment behind the question, uh, but um, I still believe that, you know, he's the President of the United States and it is the White House. And, uh, and I think it's our job to cover them. And, uh, you know, people say, well, why don't you tape them and then you can play back uh, what's appropriate. I, I, I think it's, it's our job to, to cover these things in real time and to call them out and to call out the lies and to call out uh, the mistruths. And that's what we do. So I, I actually, you know, and that's what they don't like about us. So I actually uh, am comfortable continuing to cover them live and, uh, and, uh, and, and calling it out uh, afterwards. I, I'm comfortable with that. We have a, a, a question about Kathy Griffin, who I think just before we took stage was interviewed by Kara Swisher here. Um, and she was excited about that. Do you think Kathy Griffin was treated fairly by social media and the press after the kerfuffle over her, fo her photo? Obviously, uh, Kathy was a, a longtime contributor to the CNN's New Year's Eve coverage, and that, she lost that role. Right. So, I mean, uh, I'm not sure who's ever treated fairly by social media is uh, one thing. But um, look, I, I think Kathy made a, 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 a decision to, uh, to do what she did. Uh, you know, we thought it was inappropriate, uh, and you know, obviously, uh, we, we've had our own uh, issues with the president of the United States. But I, I think that what she did there was inappropriate and over the line, and that's why we made the decision we did. And so, was she treated fairly? Uh, you know, I mean, that's for for others to decide. I think she was. Uh, we made the decision to. Uh, end our relationship with her because we thought it was inappropriate and we didn't want to be associated with that. Social media is what it is with regard to things so like she that. She won't be coming back to, to New Year's not. Eve. Um, let's see. In other sessions, there has been discussions of CNN's lack of diversity almost as a statement of fact. What are you doing to address that? Well, I, I, I think the, there, there's, two, uh, there's two aspects to diversity. Uh, there's both the on-air diversity and there's the off-air diversity. On the on-air diversity, uh, you know, I think that CNN's uh, uh, lineup of, of correspondents and hosts of original series and, and anchors uh, uh, is good. Uh, and, and that we've made uh, tremendous uh, strides in that. And I, I feel very uh, comfortable that, that we're, we're, we're doing a good job there uh, in terms of on-air diversity. Uh, with regard to off-air and behind-the-scenes diversity, um, I think that especially among African Americans in, in the uh, most uh, senior editorial positions at CNN US television, um, we need to continue to improve. And we are, it's something we've been working on for, for a long time. We continue to work on it, and we've got to continue to, uh, to make progress there. Uh, here's one. News media is becoming increasingly criticized for becoming too polarized. And again, this is something we talked about a lot in, when I did this piece about CNN, um, because there is uh, you know, something that I think the, the channel is 
uh, you know, known for in this cycle is these kind of, you know, screaming matches that very yeah, partisan people. I don't, I don't really think that's true. I, I, I think that's an unfair uh, criticism that, you know, if you, if you really watch CNN, um, there, there's, not, there's not a lot of uh, screaming political partisan fights. Do they happen from time to time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is that really uh, a predominant part of CNN? No, I think that's an unfair criticism. Well, this, uh, this person asks, as a news company, how do you find your place in this, uh, the polarization of news media, and avoid contributing to it? Well, look, I mean, the fact is we, are, we do live in an unbelievably polarized time. I gave you my thoughts earlier on, on one of the reasons <laughs> that I think that's the case. Um, uh, you know, for us, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we our, our goal, we've said it before, is facts first, and, and, and our entire raison d'etre is to hold those in power accountable and to be pro-truth. You know, we're not, we're not pro-Trump, we're not anti-Trump, we're pro-truth. And, uh, you know, I understand that in this day and age, pro-truth sometimes comes off as anti-Trump, but that's, uh, you know, that's just uh, a, a function of telling the truth. Um, and so uh, our, our place in, in uh, trying to uh, help uh, make sure that the world isn't uh, as polarized as it is, I don't know that, that we're going to be able to, to uh, fix that. I think there's a lot of factors that have contributed to that. I think, as I talked about before, the, the role of, of other cable news networks, I think, uh, I think the advent of social media, I think the uh, gerrymandering of uh, political districts that make them safe and as a result, uh, the, the folks who represent districts in America don't have to ever think about compromise. I think all of these things have contributed to the polarization of this country. This is a follow-up, I guess, to that, a good follow-up to that. How will journalism evolve in a, in a context of lack of trust and truth mainly driven by emerging platforms and digital channels? Yeah, so I, I, think, that, uh, I, I think that this is an incredibly important uh, question because it comes down to who can you trust and who, who, uh, um, who, who do you know is telling you the truth? And this is why I think brands matter, right? We go, we, you go back to the earlier question where you asked me about the emerging digital startups and things like that. I think that you earn that trust over time. And I think that, uh, which is not to say that, you know, even the best organizations uh, don't make mistakes. They do. But when they do, they, they, they acknowledge it and, and correct it. And that's what uh, good journalistic outlets do. But I think that in this world of, of new emerging platforms and startups and new digital channels, um, I, I think that they have to, uh, uh, I think they have to earn uh, the audience's goodwill and the audience's trust. I think, and that's why I think brands matter. I think that's why CNN matters. And, um, and, uh, and that's why I think we invest a tremendous amount of money every day in, uh, in doing good journalism. And it costs a lot to do good journalism. Uh, it has been said that the millions in free media value Trump got during the 2016 election gave him a massive advantage. Um, to be fair, I think you, you've talked about this uh, publicly a lot. How do you feel CNN played into that? So look, uh, I, I do not believe CNN is the reason that Donald Trump got elected. Uh, I, I, I wish we had that much power. We don't. Um, uh, the reality is I've said this publicly before. Uh, um, there's two components to this. Donald Trump uh, did get uh, a lot of free media in terms of interviews that he did. But that's not CNN or anyone else's fault. Donald Trump said yes to the interviews he was offered. All of his competitors in both the primary and general were offered all of that opportunity and they said no. And you know, I'm not gonna apologize for interviewing Donald Trump when his competitors uh, didn't have the courage uh, and foresight to actually take advantage of those opportunities. That, that's on them, that's not on CNN or the others who did those interviews with Donald Trump. Now, I've also said that I think that we made a mistake in airing as many uh, of his rallies uh, live and unedited, okay? And, and I think we made a mistake in that. Couple things, all our competitors followed us and aired all of those the same way. They've never acknowledged that they made a mistake, only I've 
you know, said that it was a mistake. That's okay. So everybody then says, oh, it was CNN that did that because we've had the, the courage of our convictions to say we made a mistake. Um, so we won't do that again. Uh, I do not believe that that's the reason why Donald Trump was elected president. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I reject that, but I do acknowledge that we made a mistake. So, but, so we won't do that again, meaning you, you, won't, you don't plan to give as much attention we, we, to, we to already, campaign we don't, coverage? We don't today. Uh, today we don't air uh, his rallies or, or most of his speeches uh, live and unedited. Uh, so, and that will continue through the campaign. Now, obviously, you know, State of the Union and Oval Office addresses and, uh, and, and things like that, obviously uh, we air live and unedited. But just, uh, just pure rallies and pure speeches, uh, we don't. What are some of the upcoming projects or initiatives that are going on at Warner, Warner Media that, ex that are exciting to you, and how will they innovate the industry? So I, I think that uh, this is where I go back to the digital conversation uh, that we were having. One, uh, the direct-to-consumer thing is probably the most important initiative and project that's going on. Uh, for the company as a whole, so I think that's great. Secondly, then, it's the digital innovation that we've been talking about and the uh, commitment to, to CNN and others. Uh, AT&T has always said that the future of, of uh, mobile is video and the future of video is mobile. We agree with that tremendously, and so I think that the combination between mobile and video is what we will uh, continue to, to prioritize. We have about five minutes left. There's some more questions we can get through. Um, regarding 2020 election coverage focused on policy, how, how will the evening block of programs, which rely heavily on opinion, reflect the shift in editorial focus? And to be clear, I don't know if that means that your um, anchors are opinionated so much as maybe there's different opinions being Yeah, uh, so I, 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 I reject the idea. I mean, I think <clears throat> if, you, if you think about our, our primetime block of programs, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I reject the idea that that's, uh, our anchors uh, are uh, opinion anchors the way that, that the other cable news networks have opinion uh, hosts in prime time. I don't, I don't agree with that at CNN. Are, 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 there, uh, are there opinions among uh, analysts and uh, contributors in prime time? There are, and, uh, and you'll continue to, to see and hear from them, uh, and so, uh, I think that we can, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. I think there can be a focus on policy uh, and analysis of that policy and also uh, have uh, input from folks who have partisan points of view because that reflects uh, what's, uh, what's going on in the conversation in America. And so I think that'll continue. Let's see what else we have. Um... Besides politics and business, where else is CNN going to invest content-wise? So I think that those are two uh, big areas where, where um, uh, we have prioritized our, our investment. I think the other thing that I think goes unnoticed and unsaid a lot is our tremendous investment in international news gathering. Uh, again, I go back to the fact that, that international uh, news is not something that's a priority at uh, frankly, any of the other television networks uh, in the United States uh, in a way that it is at CNN. And I think you just look at, at, at what we've done in the last, you know, last three to four weeks where, um, uh, you know, Clarissa Ward just spent 36 hours inside the Taliban uh, as the only uh, Western television correspondent who's ever done that, where Nema al Bagher just spent... Uh, uh, a considerable amount of time in Yemen uncovering uh, the use of uh, American military uh, products uh, to fight that war, which has already led to uh, calls for congressional hearings on that. Uh, you think about uh, the fact that Ben Wiedemann is in uh, eastern Syria now, going on 10 days, almost two weeks uh, of coverage there, our three correspondents we're currently in uh, Venezuela and on the border of, of Venezuela. You know, all of that shows a commitment to international news and investment in international news uh, in a way that I think gets lost in people like to criticize uh, opinions in prime time or political shout fests or whatever. And I think it really uh, 
um, uh, doesn't give the credit to the tremendous uh, journalism that is going on at CNN, especially uh, in this case on the international side. We could probably squeeze maybe about two more in here. Um, as you try to have commentators represent both sides of the political spectrum, are you concerned when they stretch credibility or, 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 and credulity? Yeah, uh, I do. I think it's a fair question, and I think it's a fair criticism, actually. Um, I do believe that it's important to hear from both sides, uh, or, 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 or all sides, frankly, because I think that if you don't, if you, if you don't hear all sides, then you wake up the morning after the election and you're shocked that Donald Trump is president of the United States. And I think in those cable news uh, networks that we were talking about before that are highly partisan, you know, they, they, they rarely hear from the other side. You know, uh, at, at Fox, uh, Donald Trump can do no wrong, and at MSNBC, Donald Trump can do no right. And, and neither one of those is right. And I think that if you don't hear from from all sides, then, then you're not getting the full picture of America. Now, at the same time, are there people who then go on and espouse uh, ideas and stretch credibility as is uh, suggested here? I do, and I think that, that you know, when that happens on a, on a regular and ongoing basis, I think we make a change. Have, there, have you made any changes based on that? Has there been contributors that we have to sever a relationship with because they just went too far? This yeah. is, the audience is not getting anything from this? We change contributors all the time, yes. How do you expect AI to impact your industry? Well, I, I, I think AI will, will have an impact on, uh, on all of media and, and entertainment and journalism as well. You know, there are examples of, of AI uh, replacing uh, human beings as uh, uh, anchors. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but I think it's an a, a interesting thing to think about. And I think one, I think one more. Uh, if you could bring back uh, the questions up. Um, well, let's end on this one. How, how has, has Trump changed since the days when you worked with him on The Apprentice? Yes, he used to like me. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, uh, I think that, uh, for those who don't know, obviously, I greenlit The Apprentice, and I put The uh, Apprentice on NBC Entertainment. It was obviously a different time, and, and, and the stakes were, were incredibly different. I think a lot of the things that you see in Donald Trump today were, were there at that time. He liked to brag about our ratings. He liked to uh, do a lot of press on his own. Uh, and, uh, and he liked to wing it uh, before he made decisions. I think all of those things are, are still you know, things we see in play today. Uh, and, the other, you know, and then the other change, like I said, is uh, um, listen, I think, I think a lot of, of what has happened here is he thought because we were friendly and close when we were doing The Apprentice that that uh, demanded or required that, you know, a, a degree of loyalty that should continue to be in place. You know, uh, what I think he's failed to understand is uh, journalism isn't about uh, loyalty uh, our job is to hold those in power accountable. And if he wants to put himself in the role of running for president or then being president of the United States, it's our job to uh, hold him accountable. Uh, and whether we were friends or not doesn't come into play. And so I think that's uh, what he's failed to understand. Hey, Jeff Zucker, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>